Well, welcome to uh, my midterm project. It's on a most beautiful place and something that has been long in the making over 100 years. And that is the Smithsonian's National Museum of African American History and Culture, which is on our National Mall. And as you can see in the backdrop of this picture is the Washington Monument. And to the left of uh, the museum is the National Museum of American History. So it took a lot to get this project on the mall, but when they decided to finally make sure it was on our National Mall, they put it in a picturesque setting and in a pivotal place to give it to the respect that it deserved. It opened in September of uh, 2016. I visited twice, uh, once in 2017, uh, January 10th, and the other time, November 10th, 2018. Most of the uh, slides you will see in this presentation are from my two visits. I took hundreds of pictures, and it was fun going through to decide how I is going to organize this presentation and I, and I do hope you enjoy it and they all relate for the most part to subject matter in the time period that we've discussed in class but before delving into um, different exhibits and, and different themes in the museum I wanted to give you a, a backdrop a background in terms of how the museum came to be. It's been over a century in the making. In uh, 1916, a group of African-American leaders came together to create a national memorial building dedicated as a tribute to the Negro's contribution to the achievements of America. Initially, uh, it was to honor the black soldiers and sailors who had battled the Union Army during the Civil War, uh, and then they expanded it from there. Uh, and that came about because in 1915, was the 50th anniversary celebration of the uh, Civil War, and uh, they had events surrounding that, and this came out of that uh, time period, mainly because of discrimination that was uh, traditionally hoisted upon the uh, black Union soldiers who had fought in the Civil War. In 1926, um, you see this picture. It says a National Negro Memorial at Washington. And that was never built, but that's what they um, were proposing. Uh, it w had a lot of grassroots support, but Congress uh, was always opposed to building this memorial. And finally, it did get approval in, um, on March 4th, uh, 1929. Uh, Calvin Coolidge signed a public law. But didn't guarantee funding. And you know what happened in 1929, after March. There was a stock market crash, so it got put on the back burner. In 1960, prominent blacks lobbied Congress to create a national museum. And um, that was a time frame and time period, obviously, where we were asserting ourselves as individuals and really, and, and as a group, and fighting for our civil rights. In uh, 1987, I call this guy our uh, protagonist, uh, and that's John Lewis, was elected to Congress. And in 1988, he started pushing for a museum. Every year, he would uh, have a bill trying to get it approved. Never got much headway. Um, 1994 on, I'm from the state of North Carolina, the senator from my home state, Jesse Helms, was notorious in terms of um, a Republican center and notorious in terms of his racial views and his bias. He created roadblocks for the museum. He denounced the museum from the Senate floor and said, once Congress gives the go ahead for African Americans, how can Congress then say no to Hispanics and the next group and the next group after that? And when John Lewis would propose it, Jesse would bring people up and bring it up and fight against it. Uh, so, uh, in 1996, because Helms is what now I call our antagonist. So we got John Lewis, the protagonist, Jesse Helms, the antagonist, and then we have a person I call the doer and connector. In 1996, Judge Robert Wilkins enters the fray. He wasn't a judge then. He was uh, in the public defender's offices 
in office in Washington, D.C. area, I believe. And he eventually got involved and became head of the commission, actually quit his job in the year 2000 so he could fully devote his time making sure that this happened. And uh, he brought all sides together, both Republicans and Democrats. And in 2003, Congress authorized the museum. And then the fight began where to locate the museum. They initially wanted to put it off the mall, but obviously, uh, given the historical significance of blacks in this country, we fought for it to be on the mall. I've already gone over where it's uh, situated. Uh, It's a wonderful venue. President Obama has formally opened the U.S. National Museum of African American History and Culture in Washington nearly a hundred years after it was first proposed by black Civil War veterans. Together with Ruth Bonner, the daughter of a man born a slave in Mississippi, they rang a bell from one of the first churches organized by black people. I know that years from now, like all of you, Michelle and I will be able to come here to this museum. And not just bring our kids, but hopefully our grandkids. And together we'll learn about ourselves as Americans. Our sufferings, our delights, and our triumphs. Obama said the museum was important and would help put what he called today's troubled times in a historical context, referring to current racial tensions over police killings around the country. The opening festivities are due to last three days. This slide does a great job of orienting you to the museum and its layout. Before getting into that, I just want to focus in on the name of the museum. It's the Smithsonian National Museum of African-American history and culture. I want to put emphasis on the culture. You expect this museum, obviously, to hit on the historic aspects of um, life of Africans and blacks in this country since the 1400s. But it also really delves deeply into the cultural uh, aspects and really gives the museum visitor a rich feeling and understanding um, for black culture in this country. The museum is divided into two areas, one being the sea wing, uh, which is really in the basement and the bowels of the uh, museum. That's where your history galleries are. And the green or the L uh, are where your cultural and community galleries are. Um, Actually, on my first visit in 2017, I hit the L wing, and then on my second visit, I hit the C. Uh, majority of pictures we'll see at the beginning will be from the history galleries. This is a very special picture. It was the first picture I took in the museum you know, when I visited it. It's of the Brown sisters from the Brown versus Board of Education Supreme Court case that is so famous, which is... Uh, you know, the case that really initiated and and started the civil rights movement from the legal perspective. Uh, Terry, who's on the left, is the, uh, excuse me, Linda, who's on the left, is the oldest sister. She's holding the hands of her younger sister, Terry. And this is their walk to school in the train tracks en route to Monroe Elementary in Topeka, which is a segregated black school closest to their home, and it'll take them about an hour to walk. And that's one reason why the father, Oliver, who was a plaintiff in the suit that was brought against the Topeka Board of Education, wanted to put them in a school that happened to be all white, closer to their home, so they didn't have to make this trip. This diagram shows you what you're going to be seeing on the next few slides. And uh, it is at the bottom of the museum, in the bowels from the period of 1400 to 1877, slavery and freedom. And you can see how it's organized, the transatlantic slave trade, which obviously we went over, uh, the Revolutionary War, uh, paradoxes of liberty, King Cotton, the domestic slave trade, civil war, and reflections. 
really thoughtful uh, area. Uh, whether it be on the walls or whether it be on a screen, uh, there are a lot of quotes by a lot of famous black Americans. And James Baldwin's one of my favorite uh, authors and uh, has a lot of wisdom about a lot of things. And I thought I'd share this quote as we start this presentation off. The great force of history comes from the fact that we carry it within us or unconsciously controlled by it. History is literally present in all that we do. This is a powerful and illuminating slide to start off the exhibit on slavery and freedom from 1400 to 1877. It basically uh, tells you about the genocide that occurred with the enslaved people from Africa. Enslavement of Africans was a long process that began at the moment of capture and extended through a series of ordeals leading to the plantation fields or some other forced service. Each step of the process magnified the inhumanity of New World enslavement. Scholars estimate that of every 100 people seized in America, only 64 would survive the march from the interior to the coast. Only 57 would board ships. And just 48 would live to be placed in slavery in the Americas. I guess the only thing missing from this slide is the estimated number of Africans and slaves once they got to wherever they were going, whether it be the Caribbean, the Americas, or any of the West Indies islands, how many of them perished or were killed and murdered along the way. I like the uh, title for this slide, Slavery Shapes America. Uh, even though slavery ended in 1865, um, obviously it still has pervasive and enduring impact on our current black population. The lives and labor of enslaved African Americans transformed the United States into a world power, yet they received no recognition or payment for what they created. By 1860, four million enslaved people produced well over 60% of the nation's wealth. And the slave trade valued them at 2.7 billion. Selling an enslaved person provided ready cash, explaining in part why roughly 600,000 people were sold in the domestic slave trade. This vast wealth in human form affected the entire nation. And if you look at the slide in the bottom right hand column, I don't know if you can see that, that's a currency from the uh, bank uh, state of South Carolina, just to, I guess, highlight the uh, monetary value that slaves had for uh, Americans who owned them. If you study history, you know that 1860 is a pivotal time in our country's history. We were extremely divided, about ready to enter into a civil war. We had an election, and I'm not going to equate it to the election that we're having this year, but uh, it's kind of interesting in how divisive elections can be. They had more than two candidates running. You know, in our modern elections, we only typically have two candidates we have to vote on. Uh, you know, when Ross Perot was running, uh, uh, and uh, we had three. And that's the most in my lifetime that we've ever had that were serious contenders. But uh, in this election, they had four. Abraham Lincoln did not receive a majority of the vote. As it says here, Republican Abraham Lincoln won the election with less than 40% of the popular vote and without winning one southern state. And the news of his victory uh, splintered the uh, states and caused him to succeed from the United States. You can see the uh, slide to the right, which is a map. I know it's hard for you to read it. I probably should have put that on a separate slide, but I just thought I would... Uh, point out that if you look at the northern states, those are all the states that uh, Abraham Lincoln took. And this is an electoral college map. And um, Abraham Lincoln was a Republican. 
the Southern Democratic Party, you know, John C. Breckinridge running, the Constitutional Union Party had a guy named John Bell, and the Northern Democratic had uh, Stephen Douglas. And uh, everybody knows about the Lincoln Douglas debates, which happened not to be presidential debates, but when they were running against each other in Illinois for the Senate. So that's a little trippy question a lot of people get confused on. I'm highlighting a slide on Abraham Lincoln uh, because it gives a little bit more complexity to who he was as an individual. Uh, I think when uh, Abraham Lincoln is taught in the classroom, specifically to younger people, that it's not a presentation that's in great depth about who he was as a human being and what his struggles were. Uh, he was against slavery. He believed that slavery was unjust and it placed too much power in the hands of wealthy men. Yet he was uncertain that African Americans were fit for citizenship. Lincoln began the war believing that African Americans should be sent out of the country after becoming free. But his views changed in part because of his, of his relationship with Frederick Douglass. By the end of his life, he began to speak in favor of black voting rights. Well, you know, it would have been interesting to see what would have happened in this country's history if Abraham Lincoln was sitting in the chair, not Andrew Johnson. We'll never know. Most everybody has heard of uh, that blacks were deserving of 40 acres and a mule. Actually, it's just 40 acres. In January... 1865, General William Sherman confiscated 400,000 acres of land and distributed among black men in parcels no larger than 40 acres. On Point of Pines, at least nine families were given land titles. President Andrew Johnson overturned the order so that African Americans received no land or compensation for their enslavement. And on the next slide, it refers to a note, which I think is pretty unique to actually see it, that was granted to Richard Brown in Georgia. This is the slide that uh, grants Richard Brown 40 acres, and it comes from the uh, office of, of the superintendent of Freedmen, a man by the name of Gilbert Pillsbury, signed it. And it says this, in, in accordance with Major General Sherman's order, number 15, permission is hereby granted to Richard Brown to take position of and occupy 40 acres of land situated in St. Andrews Parish Island of and being a part of what was formerly known as Hayward's Plantation by order of Major General Rufus Saxton. That's a powerful document just to see that up close. Just powerful. Now we enter the Reconstruction period, time period we, we studied extensively in class. I like Gray's quote. We don't want anyone to swear for us or to vote for us. We want those privileges for ourselves. African Americans fought hard to reconstruct America, pushing the nation to live up to its founding promise of human equality. The government moved hesitantly at first, uncertain about granting political rights to African Americans. Yet, when white Southerners elected former Confederates, passed laws resembling slavery, and terrorized black communities with murder and looting, Congress reconsidered. The U.S. Army and the Freedmen's Bureau were sent south to protect black rights. And then we know what happened. This is a very interesting series of slides uh, on the reconstruction of uh, time period, and I'm going to first start off with a quote by Frederick Douglass. You say you have emancipated us. You have, and I thank you for it. But what is your emancipation? But when you turned us loose, you gave us no acres. You turned us loose to the sky, to the storm, to the whirlwind, and worst of all, you turned us loose to the wrath of our infuriated masters. 1876. Reconstruction was the period after the Civil War when the federal government controlled the states of the former Confederacy. Federal troops were stationed throughout the South. African Americans made economic progress and elected representatives. 
the local, state, and national governments. But in 1877, when the troops withdrew, white Southerners began undermining African Americans' new rights and freedoms. Violence and intimidation were used to discourage African Americans from voting, owning land, are exercising their independence. And one of those representatives, Congressman Robert Smalls from South Carolina, you see in the, represented in the statue. And his is an interesting story. He is known for commandeering a Confederate ship because he was trusted enough by the Confederates to um, be a crew member of that ship. And he took it and gave it to the Union Army I think he fought for the Union Army, and when the war ended, he came back to South Carolina, became a very successful individual, ended up owning the same uh, plantation that he was once a slave on, and even allowed the mistress to stay on the property, but not in the big house where he uh, resided. Pretty interesting story. Robert Small. Now we move from the slavery and freedom period of our country's history up a floor to defending freedom, defining freedom, and the era of segregation, a period that almost a century long, 1876 to 1968. And you can see how the uh, museum and this floor is laid out, dealing with issues that we talked about extensively from the Jim Crow era to Great Migration, to an interactive exhibit with the lunch counter sit-ins that happened in the 60s, um, an exhibit totally dedicated to the modern civil rights movement, uh, Emmett Till Memorial, uh, honoring uh, his life, and then the uh, actual prison, that's where you see a guard tower, uh, just to talk about and you know, depict the... Uh, the prison industrial complex at that time, which was nowhere near as massive as it is now, but could be equally unfair. And a segregated rail car, you know, Plessy versus Ferguson, I think that hits home to us. And uh, then there's a house called the Freedom House, which I remember. Defending freedom, defining freedom, the era of segregation. 1877, 1968, the years after the Civil War were hopeful and disheartening for African Americans. With the end of slavery, they had hoped to attain full citizenship. Instead, they found themselves resisting efforts to put in place a new form of oppression, segregation. In the face of these attacks, African Americans created institutions and communities to help them survive and thrive. Through their struggle, they challenged the nation to live up to its ideals of freedom and equality. Seems like we're always challenging this nation to live up to its ideals of freedom and equality, whether it is 2020 or 1619. A lot of the quotes that I've depicted have similar themes. We claim exactly the same rights, privileges, and immunities as are enjoyed by white men. We ask nothing more and we will be content with nothing less. Problem with this country? Rarely have we been given more. Usually, we've definitely been given less. I guess that's editorial comment I need to make. Uh, I, I just love this slide when I saw it. And uh, it memorializes the emancipation Day Parade in 1905. You know, we're familiar with a celebration that originates from Texas called Juneteenth Celebration. And there are many other celebrations across this country. In the class I mentioned celebrating when I visited my grandparents in the summer in Paducah, Kentucky, in that area. They have an 8th of August celebration. But this uh, Maya Angelou quote uh, is profound. Bringing the gifts that my ancestors gave, I am the dream and hope of a slave. We spent some time uh, studying scientific racism in our class, and I wanted to just highlight uh, one aspect of that. Uh, 
in the museum in their exhibits. And one being Dr. Augustus L. Warner, who was affiliated with the Virginia Commonwealth University School of Medicine, which happens to be in Richmond, Virginia. And Dr. Warner uh, was known as being an early leader in the illegal dissections which were performed on African-American remains. Along with his peers, he carried out grave robbing through middlemen in order to perform dissections on deceased African-Americans. This illegal practice was so prevalent that the black community became distrustful of medical professionals and named grave robbers, night doctors, and resurrection men. We spent uh, extensive time on black codes, and uh, they were prevalent and highly responsible for holding black people down. Uh, after the Civil War, the former Confederate States passed laws intended to restrict the rights of African Americans. These codes punished vagrancy, forced freedmen to sign labor contracts, and blocked their right to vote. Failures were subject to arrest, and the labor of prisoners was auctioned off to the highest bidder. In the end, black codes created an oppressive system of customs and laws intended to tightly restrict the civic and economic rights of African Americans. On the right-hand portion of the sign, you can see different laws that pertain in different states. Um, for example, I'm from North Carolina. It says, no person of color can testify against a white person in court unless the white person agrees to it. <laughs> I can not only laugh at that. So what was the impact of these black codes? Simple. Just another form of slavery. Impacting men, women, and children, their liberty and their freedom so they can enrich the ruling class. This slide depicts in 1898 that 73% of Alabama state revenue came from convict leasing. It was profitable and it was deadly. Incarcerated men, women, and children were 10 times more likely to die if they were leased. In Mississippi, the death rate was so high that it reached epidemic proportions. Now we go into the New Negro period from 1917 to 1945, a, a period which we also discussed in our class. We did it by primarily focusing on the Harlem Renaissance. Uh, blacks were stepping forward, and it says in the uh, writings here, the experiences of World War I at home and abroad changed the attitudes of generations of African Americans. You fight for your country, you think you're entitled to have some benefits for the, that sacrifice. They were less, less willing to retreat in the face of discriminatory treatment. They felt greater pride in their African heritage and grew more strident in their resistance to attacks on their civil rights. This new attitude was evident in their music, literature, and other cultural expressions, as well as in their political and social activism. I included this slide in the uh, New Negro period because it was represented in the last slide in the bottom right hand corner, but the women are just so fashionable with uh, their 1920s hat, I'm just assuming that's the time frame, their uh, link fur uh, wrapped around them, and guess where they are? There's a football game at Howard University Griffith Stadium in Washington, D.C. Migration stories. We spent time on the migration of uh, blacks from the south to the north, to the Midwest, and then to the west. And our next story is pretty cool. And that is a migration story of somebody that's pretty famous. Can you recognize who it is without looking? Well, it's Reverend Clarence LaVon Franklin. He was a famous minister out of Detroit, Michigan. But one of his daughters is more famous. He recently died a couple of years ago. Franklin was born in Sunflower County, Mississippi, and became an itinerant preacher at 16, eventually leading a church in Memphis, Tennessee. 
1944, he moved to Buffalo, New York, and then to New Bethel Baptist Church in Detroit, Michigan, where he became a famous for his speaking and singing voice, his involvement in the civil rights movement, and his daughter, the legendary, great Aretha Franklin, known as the Queen of Soul. May the Queen of Soul and all her relatives, Clarence Franklin, rest in peace. I had to represent the, this association, this group, uh, because it's just had a powerful influence and impact on all black Americans' life, past and present, whether they know it or not. And it's the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, and it goes a little bit into its founding and the genesis of it. And it was a group not totally formed by black people, but a multiracial coalition of people who wanted to advance this cause for colored, Negro, African-American, black, et cetera, et cetera, whatever we've been called all the time. The race riot in Springfield, Illinois, 1908, and the growing number of lynchings nationwide promoted a group of white liberals to call for a meeting to discuss racial justice. Sixty people, including seven African-Americans, responded to the call. Out of this meeting, the NAACP was formed in February 1909. Its mission was to ensure the political, educational, social, and economic equality of minority group citizens of the United States and eliminate race prejudice. Uh, one thing we always talk about, people being allies. And obviously these people were allies to us. But I heard a recent podcast where we need to go even deeper than being allies. And this word has a negative connotation, but I like it in that we need accomplices, people who are willing to stand beside us, to fight with us for a just cause. I'm not only looking for allies, I'm looking for people going deeper than that, those accomplices. And the white people who were involved in setting up the NAACP were definitely that. Um, below you'll see what they call the Spring Iron Medal, and that was the I guess back in the day, the highest medal that the NAACP would extend or give out to someone. Represented in this picture is uh, slain civil rights leader, Medgar Evers, and uh, his wife, uh, Myerly Evers, on the day of their wedding. And there's a quote from Medgar. In the racial picture, things will never be as they once were. History has reached a turning point here and over the world. Freedom Now, we call this the modern civil rights movement starting in 1945-1968. Seems like we always feel like we are entitled to certain uh, privileges in this country when we go to war. Obviously 1945 is a period after World War II and this is when a generation of African Americans saw less and less reason to endure attacks on their civil rights. Training on the GI Bill had lessened African American dependence on sharecropping. Moreover, a rising number of African Americans relocated to cities. They wanted change immediately and were willing to force change even at the risk of their own safety. Returning veterans and their generations were central to the success of the civil rights movement that emerged after the war. Slide to the right deals with. Uh, African American population statistics stats of 1950. Um, total U.S. population was 150.6 million. Now it's uh, what over 300 million. African American population at that time was 10 percent. Now it's 13 percent across this country. I think it's nine to 10 percent in LA County. 68 percent of African Americans lived in the South. I'd be curious what that is right now. I'm not sure. 73 percent lived in urban areas. Areas. New York City was the city with the largest African-American population, 747,608. Is any wonder we focus on the Harlem Renaissance period? And Georgia was the state with the largest African-American population, nearly 1.1 million people. And the African-American literacy, literacy rate was 90%. That's pretty high back then, when you think about it. I'm curious what it would be now. Hopefully it's a lot higher than that. This is a uh, 
story I came across that I never knew anything about, and I wanted to highlight it. It deals with Harry and Harriet Moore. 1937, Harry Moore, with the assistance of the NAACP, filed the first suit in the South to equalize the pay of black and white teachers. He lost the case but continued the fight. As the NAACP's field secretary for Florida, he wrote and lobbied tirelessly for better schools, black voting rights, and an end to lynching. In 1951, Harry and his wife, Harriet, were killed by a bomb placed beneath their bedroom. To the right, you see the Moore's house. They were killed in the bombing on Christmas Day. How cold is that? 1951. They are first, it was the first killing of a prominent civil rights leader after World War II. And uh, that's a new found history lesson for me. Our government is composed supposedly of checks and balances, even though that doesn't always play out idealistically as people make it out to be. Uh, the executive branch is evidenced by our president and on the state and local level, our governor and mayors, the legislative branch, Congress and our senators, and then the judicial branch, being our judges. And the highest level is the Supreme Court, where we have nine justices. So many pivotal cases have um, gone through the court, and I love that this slide exhibits them on the right. And we have discussed a lot of these courts in our uh, classroom of late. Uh, 1857, the Dred Scott decision. Uh, 1896, Plessy versus Ferguson. I don't remember spending that much time on Sweet versus Painter, even though I know it was brought up. Definitely a lot of time spent on Brown <clears throat> versus Board of Education. And uh, I'm sure we'll get to um, the 1978 cases, maybe 2016 cases. The Baki case is infamous and famous for attacking um, issues of affirmative action. But the you know, Thurgood Marshall quote, and I'll just leave it at that and you can read the rest on your own, is a uh, quote I'm going to read. The rights guaranteed by our Constitution are not self enforcing, they can be made meaningful only by legislative our judicial action. Well, I started off this project with a slide depicting the Brown sisters as they walk to their school, their segregated school. And this Supreme Court case and the decision that resulted from it, to me, is the start of the modern civil rights movement, even though the slide and the way they organize it is that it starts in 1945. But this was the catalyst for change. And this is what really impacted my life tremendously and greatly in the fact that this um, verdict came out in 1954. I was born in 1958 and would see the benefits of this and other subsequent um, court cases and civil rights legislation that would impact my life and the lives of those who were part of my community, and uh, both from the local and national level, tremendously. And this is what it says. For more than a decade, Charles H. Houston, dean of Howard University Law School, and that's a name of history that everybody should know, headed a team of lawyers that brought school desegregation cases in Delaware, Kansas, South Carolina, Virginia, and the District of Columbia. After Houston's death, Thurgood Marshall argued, argued a joint appeal of these cases before the U.S. Supreme Court in the Brown versus Board of Education. On May 17, 1954, Chief Justice Earl Warren issued a unanimous decision that racial segregation is unconstitutional, violating the 14th Amendment's Equal Protection Clause. Another thing that we studied in this class, the 13th Amendment, the 14th, and the 15th. You're doing good, Teach.
with all deliberate speed. We don't get into what that means during this slide in my comments. Well, first, let's just read the exhibit. In 1954, the Supreme Court ruled that segregated education was unconstitutional and ordered schools to desegregate with all deliberate speed. But across the South, governments and school systems resisted integration in their schools. White families moved their children to new private schools. Hostile mobs confronted African-American children who tried to enter white schools. The courage of African-American parents and children to confront this resistance was a tribute to their commitment to breaking old traditions and creating a new possibilities for future generations. So I grew up in this time frame of all deliberate speed. I never went to public school. I went to private school. My mother was a English and Latin teacher at a all black school, public school, high school called uh, Atkins High School. She would then become a guidance counselor. And in my hometown, in 1970, is when the public schools finally, 16 years after this legislation, decided to fully integrate the school system. In 1957, a few black students integrated all white schools, but until 1970, basically there was de facto segregation in my hometown. And a lot of school systems across the country were like this. Even the school systems out here in the West Coast. Um, busing started in my hometown in 1971, but guess what? Now the schools are resegregated and just recently looked up the uh, article, and many of the schools have been segregated over the last 40 years as national court decisions and local political ones favored neighborhood schools over racially and economically balanced ones. My hometown, they stopped busing kids, so a lot of idealistic viewpoints coming out based off of Brown versus the Board of Education, but the reality is is that uh, there are so many ways that people could resist it that the intents in a lot of ways have been reversed. And in certain communities, especially the middle school, not much needs to be said about the 64 Civil Rights Act and 65 Voting Rights Act. Just incredible, powerful legislation that changed the... Uh, course of um, every black American's life. And when I hear our current president, Donald John Trump, talk about that, excepting for Abraham Lincoln, he's done the most for blacks. It's laughable. Um, when you understand that uh, Lyndon Baines Johnson, who was known not to be from Texas, and um, if you heard private conversations behind closed doors, use the N-word with guards supplies. But in terms of his effectiveness as a legislator and his impact on the fortunes and directions of the black community, um, him spearheading these uh, two initiatives is something to be cherished and to be celebrated. And I thank him for it. LBJ signing the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Besides him, I recognize two people. That would be Martin Luther King, and to his left, Ralph D. Abernathy, both members of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. Wish I knew more about the others and who they were. I think it's uh, appropriate to feature Bayard Rustin for a lot of reasons, mainly because of his organizational skills and his impact on doing the dirty work um, behind the scenes to uh, promote and to advance the cause. And we also studied uh, black gender and sexuality. And during his time frame, it was very hard for a man to be openly gay and to uh, advance himself and not have a, a lot of bias come his way. And um, just thought his life and who he was should be highlighted in this uh, midterm project I'm doing. Bayard Rustin was a gay man and a master civil rights strategist. 
Beginning in the 1930s, he was involved with the peace movement and civil rights activism. As a Quaker, he believed in nonviolent resistance, disapproved of war, and promoted, promoted universal human rights. Rustin helped Martin Luther King Jr. in Montgomery and was a key organizer of the March on Washington in 1963. His homosexuality troubled some civil rights leaders, but King found him an invaluable advisor. Rustin continued his activism until his death in 1980. The Freedom Rides. Uh, I've known people who were Freedom Riders, and it's just interesting for me as a mature adult to be able to uh, understand this time period in our country's history and to communicate it. We studied the uh, core just recently, the Congress of Racial Equality. In 61, they recruited people to challenge segregated interstate bus travel facilities. Thirteen riders went first, leaving Washington, D.C. in May for New Orleans. In South Carolina, John Lewis and two colleagues were attacked trying to use a white waiting room. In Anniston, Alabama, one bus was firebombed and the riders beaten. Media coverage of the violence prompted Attorney General Robert Kennedy to intervene, and the Interstate Commerce Commission eventually issued regulations against segregation in interstate travel. When you understand, you know, that, uh, not that Brown versus the Board of Education dealt explicitly with this, but when you understand that it shot down Plessy versus Ferguson, which was a transportation case and dealt with separate but equal, you would think that it would have applied to uh, interstate travel on buses long before 1961. Just glad these people were brave enough to right this wrong. I wanted to highlight this. It's such a stark image, and uh, he was also a freedom rider. And during this time, we had a lot of allies, and I also like to think of them as accomplices, who, who were willing to put their life on the line to better humanity. And this is James Peck saying, I am a victim of an attempt at lynching by hoodlums. This picture was taken to New York City Port Authority bus terminal. And Peck was beaten by Klansmen at the bus station in Anniston, Alabama, which we talked about in our last slide. And the white hospital there refused to treat him. So that just shows you how virulent and the hate was in, in reference to people, whether they're black or white, who wanted to assist uh, the black advancing themselves in our society. When I came upon Joan Trump Power, Names now Joan Trump Power Mulholland, if you want to do some research on her. In the uh, museum, I was just blown away at you know, the depth of her commitment. And I went on a binge to learn about this woman. And you'll kind of understand why. She epitomizes to me the term ally, and more deeper meaning, which I've mentioned in several other slides, accomplished. She had to say this about segregation. Segregation was unfair. It was wrong, morally, religiously. As a Southerner, a white Southerner, I felt that we should do what we could to make the South better and to rid ourselves of this evil. Now, somebody can think that, and during this time, they might not act on it, but she acted on it. She was a 19-year-old student at Duke University. And she joined the protests at the time that were going on in Durham, North Carolina. You know, and basically in that research triangle area, Raleigh, Durham, Chapel Hill, Raleigh's where SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, uh, was founded at Shaw University. Um, and then she later joined the, the Freedom Rides and was arrested, fined, and sent to Parchman Farm, the state penitentiary of Mississippi. With other Freedom Riders, she remained there three months under terrible conditions. After her release, this student who was at Duke University, which still today is one of the finest institutions in the country, she transferred to an all-black school. Couldn't have been that many white people back then. Uh, HBCU College, Tuluga, Tougaloo College in Mississippi. And there she was the first white woman accepted into Delta Sigma Theta sorority. She remained actively involved in protests through the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. 
You can also read. Uh, I would also uh, just tell you to go to YouTube if you want to do more um, research on her. She's a shero for me, and because of her level of commitment and her her son did a documentary on her, which is exceptionally good. But there are tons of interviews with this woman. Just to realize her depth of commitment is something I've always appreciated. And it was worth my time to go through that museum just to learn about her. And she's a she girl for me. Slavery's Long Shadow. I guess my question is, how long is that shadow? You know, Martin Luther King is famous for saying that the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. And we look at the impact of slavery and how it still uh, permeates the society. That shadow and that question about Justice that enters into the equation on, on another level uh, makes you think. So from the aftermath of the Civil War through the middle of the 20th century, states and communities across the American South constructed political and legal systems designed to disenfranchise and criminalize black life. The long shadow of slavery also entwined itself through a system of extra-legal practices bent on the surveillance, exploitation, and even destruction of black bodies. The convict labor system enacted one of slavery's most enduring afterlives, wherein African Americans arrested for petty crimes such as vagrancy or public disorder were incarcerated and leased by the um, The next four slides on the convict labor system, um, they speak for themselves, reflect. Frederick Douglass said the following in 1893, the convict lease system and lynch law are twin infamies which flourish hand in hand in many of the United States. They are the two great outgrowths and result of the class legislation under which our people suffer today. What's always interesting about going through a museum like this, and there's nothing really quite like this in terms of the subject category we're talking about, African American history and culture, is you learn about people that you never heard about. And the assault on Reese Taylor is new to me. So in September 1944, after an evening church service in Abbeville, Alabama, Reese Taylor was kidnapped by a group of white men. The young mother was raped and beaten at gunpoint, blindfolded, and left by the road. She reported her attack to a local sheriff who was slow to respond. The Alabama NAACP sent one of its best staff members, Rosa Parks, ever heard that name before, to seek justice for Taylor, but no one was tried for the assault. Two all-white male juries refused to indict the accused. And the article to your right goes into depth about people coming to Macy's husband and asking him if he's willing to take $600 for the rape of his wife. How abhorrent and disgusting is that? Here's a 
picture of Recy Taylor at the age of 91 in 2011 when the state of Alabama formally apologized to Taylor for her treatment by the state's legal system. And that's what needs to happen more in America in terms of having uh, racial reconciliation where people and institutions admit their past wrongs. I'm encouraged, for example, in uh, our area that the city of Glendale has apologized for the ways in which they have conducted business towards uh, African-Americans. So we go to another level on the concourse and where we get into another section and it's a changing America, 1968 and beyond. And I would think that um, for the rest of the semester that we're going to be getting into this area a lot more. Uh, the way it's organized, because 1968 was just a huge year. And they have a whole section on the events of 1968. And then they have a little area that says the movement marches on. And one thing I always try to get across, is in some ways what happened to the movement, it became a moment. And let's just hope that what we've seen now in 2020, we're able to sustain that energy so it doesn't become a moment and that we can have the movement continue through the years to get the changes we need uh, to get the society headed in the right direction. Um, cities and suburbs, you know, that was uh, another section here. And then they have a section called decades where you're dealing with the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, 2000, trying to hit a lot of things that are contemporary. And like everything we should think about when we're looking at this time period in terms of issues revolving around race and discrimination and uh, the black experience, it's just to really reflect on all the obstacles that have been put upon our people and how we have persevered and have uh, been in the, not only in the shoulders of, uh, of the ancestors that have come before us, but have been in the palm where they are grasping us and looking after us. And, uh, it's just uh, a powerful experience to be uh, in this museum and just to be inundated with this history. So we're now dealing with a change in America, an America that we are still in. You know, we, we are still evolving, still changing, hopefully still growing. And they ask this question, what are we to make of the last... 50 Years of Progress and Paradox. This exhibition examines the strategies Americans have used to wrestle with racial discrimination, cultural exclusion, and economic inequality since 1968, and explores the evolving status of the African American community, just as the civil rights and black power movements pursue goals of justice and equality in the 20th century. Americans must decide how to advance these goals into the 21st century. And we're seeing this question, this paradox, play out right in front of us today, uh, especially after the lynching and murder of publicly of, of George Floyd, which I equate to having the same impact on our country's history as the murder of Emmett Till. So... That's a question to be addressed and to be answered as we uh, go forth in the latter part of our semester. Statement from MLK on a change in America. And MLK was starting during this time frame and time period in the latter stages of his short life to change his focus. You can see on the right, it says, in honor of Dr. Martin Luther King, who was shot and murdered in Memphis, Tennessee in 1968 in honor of him by these uh, have to be Vietnam veterans in Vietnam. And I think it's a powerful image of the time, but the King was looking at things from an economic standpoint more than so obviously had the civil rights focus in his mind frame, but trying to address poor people's issues and also looking at the militarism, the empire that we are and how we can get the hell out of Vietnam. And that was his focus then. He was really upsetting a lot of people uh, with his tact. In some ways, some people felt he was becoming irrelevant during this time frame. But he comes with this quote. I am disappointed with our failure to deal positively and forthrightly 
with the triple evils of racism, economic exploitation, and militarism. I'm black and I'm proud. I'm black and I'm proud. That searing anthem reverberated through the black community in 1968 when Brother James Brown threw down with Say It Loud, I'm Black and I'm Proud. As a nine-year-old kid who would turn 10, it was something that might not in that year be able to internalize, but definitely later internalize and really appreciate it. The magic and the beauty of that song and the pride that it gave you to say those words out loud and to raise your consciousness to understand you had a place in this society and that you shouldn't be ashamed of it, but you should be proud. So I'll always be thankful for Brother James Brown coming out with this song, as well as many others. Affirmative action. This has been a concept that has been misunderstood by many. And as someone who benefited, benefited from uh, affirmative action laws and legislation, uh, I always try to correct that wrong and explain to people why it's needed. And it's kind of interesting. You know, people are coming back towards this way of thinking in terms of uh, legislation that has been proposed, uh, who people are looking at to um, vote to put in office to rectify some of the, the wrongs in our uh, civilization. We even have propositions that have been suggested by uh, L.A. County Board of Supervisors to dedicate 10% of the uh, money to address social needs that have been neglected before, uh, but in terms of allocating proper funding. New affirmative action laws requiring equal opportunity in the workplace made jobs, more jobs available to African Americans, especially in government and education. This made a stable income possible for a growing number of people. Yet for families to be solid members of the black middle class, both the husband and wife had to work. As more African Americans enrolled at predominantly white colleges, historically black colleges and universities faced increased competition for prospective black students. Uh, I come from a two-parent household where both parents work, both my mother and my father, both in the educational arena, one on a university setting, the other one in a high school setting. So very common for me to see black women working. Women and the movement, and we start out with a quote from Mary McLeod with whom who will be featured in some later slides. The true worth of a race must be measured by the character of its womanhood. That seems like a very obvious statement, uh, given that uh, life begins in a mother's womb, and as my mother says, there's no love like a mother's love. The critical role played by women in the civil rights movement has not received enough recognition. They were the backbone of the movement, both behind the scenes and on the front lines. Women served in multiple capacities as strategists, advocates, and sources of inspiration. They participated despite the dangers, especially the threat of sexual assault. They understood the potential impact of their actions for future generations. Uh, when Martin King died in 1968, he was in the process of uh, organizing another type of march on Washington. It was called the Poor People's Campaign. He had initiated a mass movement to uh, alleviate the poverty that ensnared 35 million Americans. This was a multiracial campaign that included American Indians, Latinos, and poor whites. It was led by Reverend Ralph Abernathy after King died. Thousands of protesters traveled to D.C. in May of 68 to push for a guaranteed minimum income Still fighting for that today. That's what uh, in the debate last night uh, between Biden and Trump, you know, they focused on a $15 hourly wage. Job programs 
and educational opportunities. They built a 3,000-person tent city on the National Mall and stayed for six weeks. What was amazing to me uh, in going through the exhibit was how much was dedicated to Resurrection City. I didn't think of it as this big pivotal moment in our country's history, even though it is tied into King's le legacy. And so the legacy of Resurrection City. People left Resurrection City disappointed and unclear about future direction. Inspired by King, they had tried something never before attempted, a multiracial coalition demanding fundamental change. They learned how difficult that would be, how important it was for each group to create its own solidarity, and how future coalitions require the ability to acknowledge their differences but focus on their shared values. The Poor People's Campaign struggle was not in vain, concluded children's activist Marion Wright Elliman. I guess there's a lot of lessons that we can learn from that in terms of building coalitions that are multiracial, given what's happening in today's society. So maybe it's wise just to go back and look at the legacy of Resurrection City. Jesse Jackson was one of uh, Martin Luther King's chief lieutenants when uh, he passed away. Matter of fact, he was right there at the Lorraine Motel in Memphis, Tennessee, on the steps pointing toward where the gunshot comes from. It's an infamous and famous picture. He was only 26 years old when this picture was taken, and uh, he had already been a grizzled veteran of the civil rights movement. He was named the city manager of the Resurrection City and obviously spent the six weeks there guiding, leading, and directing. Not only is this a museum that deals with the past, it deals with the present. And this statement uh, and these questions are something that we can contemplate now, and also we can also uh, use to digest the past. What does it mean to be black in America today? How does racial identification intersect with other forms of belonging? Does race still matter? African Americans are leading and shaping global conversations that will define this century, with the census finding each generation of Americans more multiracial than the last, and immigration bringing greater ethnic diversity to black populations in the United States. Notions of identity and community will continue to change. As the experience of being black in America evolves, so will the ways in which a more diverse black America influences global history and culture. Wow. Some really good, thoughtful uh, questions to really think about. Naomi Murakawa ponders this 21st century question. If the problems of the 20th century was, in W.E.B. Du Bois' famous words, the problem of the color line, and the problem of the 21st century is the problem of color blindness, the refusal to acknowledge the causes and consequences of enduring racial stratification. These are the final slides I will show of the time period that dealt with a change in America starting in 1968 and beyond, and we're in the beyond portion, but I thought it was appropriate to show the picture of Barack Obama's inauguration. And I think every black American remembered the day in Chicago and this day in Washington when he was elected president and when he was inducted as president. And to go back to what Brother James Brown said in 1968, Say it loud, I'm black and I'm proud. I'm just proud of this moment and that the country could reach this far given the history. Sad to say, we took a little bit of a, well, not a little bit, a big back, back, back step um, into the Reagan and Southern strategy ever era. But let's listen to this quote from Barack. Change will not come if we wait for some other person or some other time. We are the ones we've been waiting for. We are the change that we seek. 
This is a review slide uh, to get yourself an opportunity to orient yourself to where you've been, which were the history galleries, C1, C2, and C3. Now you're able to go up to the upper court concourse area and move into the elms, where you will experience not only history, but a lot of the current and past culture of uh, black American life. And so we move on and go to the next slide. Uh, in the next series of uh, slides, you will see images from all three of these areas, and they'll be mixed up together, so I'm not going to segment them like I did in the beginning portion of uh, this presentation. This is more of the cultural and community aspects of black life versus the historic, even though obviously it has a historic component in it. I hope you enjoy it. One of the things with uh, any group of people is that you have courtship, you're going to have love, and you're going to have family. And during slavery, we knew how hard it was to have a normal family life. And to see a, a document such as this, which is their marriage certificate, and given that this was in July 9th, 1874, is pretty special. Families, as we know, are a critical part of any community. Doing slavery, creating and maintaining them were not always easy. Enslaved people were forbidden to marry for years. Many states outlawed interracial unions. This section features a rare marriage certificate from an African-American couple in 1874, along with well-known and lesser-known figures sharing special moments with loved ones. So to Augustus Johnson and Miss Melinda Murphy, we celebrate you, celebrate your marriage in 2020. I wanted to highlight Henry Boyd uh, because it's a unique story and there'll be another slide to tell you what eventually happened with Henry. He ran a manufacturing company. He was born into slavery in Kentucky. He became one of the most successful black businessmen of the 19th century from 1836 to 1863. So this was before the Civil War, and I believe he was born in like 1802. His furniture factory in Cincinnati supplied hotels and households throughout the South and West with Boyd's bedsteads. This is a uh, two-part slide dealing with what Henry Boyd actually made, his bedstead. So you can see that to the left. And then you read the words, burned out. He's very successful, so you know there are people not happy, necessarily happy with his success. It says, Henry Boyd was able to build a successful business in large part because of the professional and political relationships he cultivated with the white community in Cincinnati. While abolitionists celebrated Boyd's achievements and held him up as a model of African-American ingenuity and enterprise, his success also sparked resentment from working-class whites and those supported of the slavery system. Boyd eventually closed his business due to repeated arsons, and he continued to work as a carpenter until his death in 1886. Man, brothers had it hard back then. You could be brilliant, entrepreneurial, successful, and you'll have people who are jealous of your success just because of the color of the skin. You're going to take it out on you. And there's so many you know, instances of that, that that happened in America uh, from the times before slavery to even the times of now. We studied the uh, Niagara Movement in class, and I thought it was only appropriate to to share these slides that I took uh, at the museum. Now, we know that the Niagara Movement was closely connected with the NAACP. And in 1905, W. E. Du Bois and journalist William Monroe Trotter convened a group of African-American intellectuals in Niagara Falls, Canada, to discuss strategies for challenging racial injustice. 
The activists of the Niagara movement favored direct and immediate action to end segregation, in contrast to the gradual approach promoted by Booker T. Washington. After the movement dissolved in 1910, the boys encouraged members to join the newly formed NAACP to continue the fight against discrimination. They had a uh, section on self-presentation, you know, in terms of you look good, you feel good, and also you have to represent yourself to other people so that uh, you can uh, have entree in, into this world in terms of building connections. So people during this time frame, and even <laughs> obviously up to the time that uh, I was brought into this earth and have lived on this earth, I've always been interested and committed to presenting themselves in the best possible light. What I liked about this slide was how dapper these two women were, but also who they were connected to. These are the great nieces of Harriet Tubman. And this photo was taken in 1913. The two women are Eva Stewart Northrop and Alita Stewart. One thing we haven't touched on a lot in our class, and I think it's very important too, is the power of the press. And they had a section dedicated to this with old-time presses that were used back during this time frame. And it reads as such. The first African-American newspaper, the Freedom Journal, was published in 1827. Ever since, African-Americans have used the press to establish an independent voice for black communities and advance the struggle for freedom and equality. Publishers and journalists challenge racism by exposing injustice reporting on civil rights activism and presenting positive images of black identity and achievement. Publications also re reflected the diversity of black people in the United States and throughout. That's where we end. I cut off the end portion of it, but you get the idea. I decided to highlight uh, on this, these slides two important newspapers, the the North Star being Frederick Douglass's um, paper. And this was a June 8, 1819 copy. And on the right is a Chicago Defender, which is still in business. In our own town of Los Angeles, we have Los Angeles Sentinel. In my hometown, we had the Winston-Salem Chronicle. Uh, my father regularly read the Baltimore Afro-American. And the Pittsburgh Courier, we learned that the Brotherhood of the Sleeping Car Porters would carry those type of newspapers from the East Coast down south on the train to let the people know what their options were. So we never can underestimate the power of the press. When you're discussing the power of the press, you have to mention Ida B. Wells in the discussion. One of the greatest journalists who's ever lived who attacked racism at its core, trying to prevent the lynching and the unproven accusations of black men supposedly assaulting, raping, sexually abusing white women. And she said this, the people must know before they can act, and there is no educator to compare with the press. When I was growing up, you knew who John H. Johnson was. You knew who the Johnson Publishing Company were. Well, every black household in America had what they called the Black Bible, which was Jet Magazine, and they had Ebony. And the Johnson Publishing Company would come through town with the Ebony Fashion Fair, showcasing, and look, and we talked about self-presentation, these beautiful black women in these flamboyant outfits, and... Um, as John H. Johnson says here, you have to change images before you can change acts in institution. And John H. Johnson did a lot for America in changing the image of black people, both outside the community and within the community. And to that, we thank him for his vision. I said earlier that we would have some additional exhibits on Mary McLeod Thune, who was most well known for creating the National Council of Negro Women, along with being a founder of Bethune-Cookman College. 
this is a beautiful outfit she once wore, and it's lovely. I remember seeing it up close and in person. Very colorful. And Mary says this, America can be changed. It will be changed. And we're still hoping for that change. And I will say this, in my lifetime, being a child who was born in 58, a child who was raised in the 60s, came of age in the 70s, I saw, have seen seismic changes in our society. And I hope to continue to see that happen again within this time frame. This is a, an opportunity for us to advance the cause to a higher and, uh, and a higher level. I mentioned Mary McLeod Bethune founding the National Council of Negro Women in my last slide. She founded this organization in 1935. She envisioned a centralized organization that would coordinate the efforts of diverse African Amendment American women's associations and represent their political interests at the national level. To describe her vision, Thune used the image of a wheel with the NCNW as a hub and the member organizations as its spokes. By 1949, when Bethune retired as president, the NCNW included over 20 national women organizations. Uh, a lot of fraternity sororities, excuse me, uh, like the Delta Sigma Theta, Alpha Kappa Alta, were a part of uh, this organization, as well as um, some church, large church groups. Um, pretty powerful concept to coalesce these group of women who had national outreach into one body so they could have a centralized message. I wanted to highlight this group of people because when we think of Brown versus the Board of Education, we normally only think of the Brown sisters. Uh, we don't realize that there were four other lawsuits attached to that Supreme Court ruling. And these young people from Virginia, their story is worth knowing about. In 1951, fed up with poor conditions at the segregated Robert Rusa Morton High School in Farmville, Virginia, a group of students led by 16-year-old Barbara Johns went on strike to, to demand a new school building. NAACP lawyers convinced the students to go to court to fight for desegregated schools rather than a new segregated one. Farmville became one of five legal cases included in the landmark 1954 U.S. Supreme Court ruling, Brown v. Board of Education. That's another. Do you know? Or did you know? I decided to highlight Mamie Till. And that's because we're so used to seeing Emmett Till's image. It was so horrific. And this is uh, Mamie at the burial site, which was in Alsa, Illinois, and it's called Burr Oak Cemetery. And when I look at the depth and impact that Emmett Till had on change in American society, I have to connect that today with George Floyd, and that his death had similar impact. And it's the fuel and the catalyst because it's so outrageous to spark people who had never really thought deeply about the injustices that minorities face in society to look inward and be retrospective and to really reflect on how they could become or what type of change agent they could become. We talked in my class about the Green Book, but really didn't delve deeply in it, so I thought I'd highlight uh, it in this part of the presentation. And it's also from a personal standpoint that I'll connect uh, a part of my family's legacy and history as it relates to the Green Book. But I got a kick out of the uh, name being mentioned in this uh, exhibit when I was sitting in the car and, and, and enjoying interacting with the video. And it's about Clarence, the traveling salesman. Hope you enjoy it. I'm Clarence. You know he's a traveling salesman now. Well, he was this on his last trip. 
It's called the Green Desert. It tells you safe places we can stop. Restaurants, hotels, all over the country. Take a look and see for yourself. Take a look and see for well, most folks choose between two routes to get to Huntsville, Alabama. First one is the fastest. First one is the fastest. I want to share with you a personal connection that uh, my family has with the Green Book. What you see in front of you is the Hotel Metropolitan. And the Hotel Metropolitan is located in Paducah, Kentucky. It was owned by my grandparents, Lester and Olivia Gaines. I spent every summer there in my formative years, even helped them out around the hotel and were painting it. And they reclaimed this. My father donated this hotel to the city and they did a renovation project, raised money. It was in shabby condition and it's now a museum. At one point, it was part of what they call the Chitlin Circuit and it housed many great black thinkers, performers, and icons like Louis Armstrong, Cab Calloway, Thurgood Marshall. I can vividly remember my grandmother talking about Ike and Tina Turner when they stayed there. I wanted to highlight this slide because it mentions a major U.S. corporation, which at the time was Esso Standard Oil, which later became Exxon, which was targeting their market efforts toward black consumers and supported the Green Book. Okay, come right up. Y'all go on to any of those restaurants for me to be quick about them. The Divine Nine. Um, when I was going through this exhibit, and I'll show you other fraternities and sororities that are not a part of the Divine Nine that my parents were connected to. Um, it was a prideful moment because I know all about them. My mother and my sister are AKAs, Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority. And my dad's a member of Omega Psi Phi fraternity. And I understood the deep richness of uh, black social life and cultural ties and connections that we have in the community. And I'm glad that all Americans can go through these type of exhibits in this museum and see the richness of black life that they might not be aware of. The Divine Nine, as we all know, is a very powerful source of connections and love and support in the black community. Lynx Incorporated, this is another social organization that um, my mother and my sister are both involved with and uh, I'm proud of their association with the Lynx. We, I used to kid my mother when she'd go to a Lynx meeting, a big time Lynx. Uh, it's a volunteer service organization that was founded in eight, 1946. They have an uh, annual co-founder award honors achievement by African American women in areas of youth services, the arts, National and International Issues and Health and Human Services. Just a beautiful award that they gave out and a wonderful award. The Boule, also known as Sigma Pi Phi. This is an organization that my father is a part of. And you're not allowed to be invited to this organization until you're a little bit older in life and you accomplish something. It's the oldest African-American Greek letter organization. A group of Philadelphia physicians founded the fraternity in 1904 to cultivate fellowship among black professional men. Members have included leaders from the fields of academia, medicine, law, religion, and business. And when the boule asks for you to consider them, you best think hard and long about it and say yes. It's an honor to be associated with these group of men. On my first visit uh, to the museum in 2017, I spent a lot of time in the sports uh, area. It's something that uh, I'm very interested in. I was a college athlete. I was involved in professional basketball. As you will see later on, I highlight some of the uh, 
teams I've been associated with. And sports has also been a great leveler in the playing field and a change agent in society. And we haven't spent too much time on that, if any, in our class. And so I just wanted to highlight uh, this aspect of the museum. Nelson Mandela said, sports can create hope where once there was only despair. It is more powerful than governments in breaking down racial barriers. It lasts in the face of all types of discrimination. And the exhibit says, sports has a unique, in American, unique role in American culture. Through much of the nation's history, African Americans were systematically denied opportunities to participate at the highest levels of competition. Yet sports were also among the earliest and most high-profile spaces to accept African Americans on terms of relative equality. For African Americans, sport records and individual accomplishments matter. But it's the political and social implication of sports that has transformed, that have transformed the world. And we see that playing out today, you know, in terms of the protests that uh, Colin Kaepernick got lambasted for where now the athletes today are regularly getting on one knee and challenging America to live up to the symbolism that is imbued in the United States flag and our national anthem. There's a section in the sports area called Game Changers and anybody who is in this museum is pretty much a game changer. You, know, you look at the history of black America, and if you get your name and your image put in here, it says something about your contribution to our society. But this is how they define game changers. Game changers are the people, events, and institutions that have forced the sports world and larger society to alter its practices, belief systems, or racial politics. Some of these shifts have led to the mainstreaming of African American cultural practices and the redefinition of gender roles, as well as a change in the racial composition of athletic institutions. The impact of these game changers demonstrates the power of sports to transform the world. The black athlete with superior skills and proud attitude has become a dominant figure in the Negroes' struggle for equality. You might recognize the image on the right, because I recently shared it um, with our class on our Pronto app. The image on the right is at San Jose State University. The image on the left was in the African American Museum. Um, Tommy Smith and John Carlos are definitely game changers. And I wrote this a few days ago. <clears throat> the race fist that shocked the world 52 years ago today. Tommy Smith and John Carlos raised their fist after winning gold and bronze in the 200 meters at the 1968 Mexico City Olympics. They were part of the Olympic project for human rights and took a stand to challenge the Olympic movement to live up to the ideals they espouse and to protest the racism in society and sports that existed throughout the world. Respect, and I'm proud to stand in the spot of Australian Peter Norman, who wore a OPHR badge to demonstrate his support for their cause. I'll never forget this moment, as many Americans have. It's one of the most unique and powerful protest ever in American sports history and its legacy endure. And if you ever get uh, to the Bay Area, make sure to drop by San Jose and see this beautiful um, statue uh, that commemorates the uh, 1968 uh, demonstration by Tommy Smith and John Carlos. Both these men are game changers. You've already learned a little bit about John Carlos through his stand in the Olympic movement. Uh, how can you ask someone to live in the world, to exist in the world, and not have something to say about injustice? 
Kurt Floyd, you might not know who he is. He played for the St. Louis Cardinals in baseball, and he challenged baseball's reserve clause, which simply made it easier for baseball players to enter into the free agent marketplace. This not only affected baseball, it affected other sports. So Kurt Floyd was a change agent to freeing up athletes, all athletes' rights in the sport. And he paid a price for that. But today we acknowledge him for his, his sacrifice and his courage. And he said this, I am pleased that God made my skin black, but I wish he had made it thicker. And I think we all have those moments when it comes to dealing with people in the world, no matter what your skin is, color is. But your skin color is black, definitely something you can relate. This figure is definitely a game changer. And his name is Jesse Owens, and you see me taking a selfie with the statue, something I like to do. And Jesse was best known for his uh, winning four gold medals during the Olympic Games in Berlin, Germany, during the reign of Adolf Hitler, totally shooting down the notion of superiority, superiority and supremacy of the Aryan, a white race. Jesse Owens' victories on the track served as examples of possibility for the African American community while casting doubt on the notion of biological determinism and the supremacy of one race over another. Jackie Robinson is definitely another game changer. Some might say he even is the game changer when he entered graded baseball in the 1940s. My father, in his book, They Call Me Big House, starts off his first chapter by talking about the impact of Jackie Robinson in American life and in his life and what Jackie Robinson meant to him. This quote, The right of every American to first-class citizenship is the most important issue of our time. Number 42 of the Brooklyn Dodgers, we thank you for your sacrifice and your courage. And most importantly, your temperament and ability to deal with all the wrongs that were thrown your way in the initial stages of breaking into the Major League Baseball. We get two for the price of one here. Game changers in two different avenues of life, but each having a impact not only on a national level but on a worldwide level especially Muhammad Ali uh, Muhammad Ali known as one of the greatest boxers if not the greatest boxer of all time captured the imagination of sports fans like no the athlete in my lifetime and I just love this picture of him with Malcolm X who was uh, the main reason for his conversion to the Muslim faith. And Malcolm being a photographer in this case, uh, not taking this picture, but you see the camera in his hand, just a precious picture and capturing two pivotal and important figures in American history. I first became aware of Paul Robeson when my dad was honored the Paul Robinson Award, but I learned about the significance of that award when I became old enough to appreciate it and look into who this man was. He's definitely a game changer. Scholar athlete, all-American football player, class valedictorian at Rutgers University, law school graduate, Columbia, singer, actor, a renaissance man ostracized from American society because of his communistic views. He had this to say, as an artist I come to sing, but as a citizen I will always speak for peace, and no one can silence me in this. And he lived that kind of life, to have that kind of courage to let his words be authentic and true, and not to be silenced to satisfy a majority view. I appreciate you, Mr. Robeson. This is a powerful image if you understand the significance of it 
and not everybody will. And if you notice my caption, I said game changers, all of them. And they were in support of Muhammad Ali. And what were they in support of? Muhammad Ali and him exercising his right on uh, because of his religious convictions to not accept being drafted into the United States Army in the Vietnam War. He was a conscientious objector that wasn't uh, respected uh, by the uh, American uh, government. Uh, they made him an example, and, and because of that, he had to fight for his, uh, his right, and eventually won that case, but it also impacted his boxing career tremendously, where he was in exile for three years. Sitting next to Muhammad Ali is Jim Brown. And as a matter of fact, this picture, if you look below, you'll see Jim Brown is a young sports star at uh, Syracuse University, where he was a three-sport athlete and All-American in two of them, being football and lacrosse. The other played basketball, and he was a starter and was pretty accomplished at that. I consider Jim Brown to be one of, if not the greatest athletes of all time. Um, to the left of Muhammad Ali is the great Bill Russell, who won 11 out of 13 championships. And to the right of Jim Brown is Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. And you can just go on and list the accomplishments of the men behind them who were sports stars back in the day in a variety of different sports. And just uh, realize... Uh, the, the power of this image and them coming together to support a fellow athlete who believed in what he was doing. Classic photo. Just had to share it with you. I haven't uh, spent a lot of time on the impact of women in sports. You know, I'm about ready to get to that. But I want to talk about women pre-Title IX. And this meant so much for me to see... You know, Wilma Rudolph featured in the African American Museum along with the Tennessee A and I Tiger Bells, now Tennessee State. Because when I was a young kid <clears throat> and during assemblies, about every year for four years, we always saw this movie motion picture of Ed Temple's famous Tennessee State Tiger Bells, which won um, multiple. Um, Olympic medals. For example, Wilma Rudolph herself won three gold medals in the 1960 Rome Olympics. In 1956, she won a bronze medal in a relay. And so she's a four-time Olympic medalist. So I hope to take the time to watch the video. I'm just going to play a little bit of it. It's about two minutes long. I'm not going to share it all just to get the uh, a little of, of what they're talking about. And the first American woman to win three gold medals in one Olympics. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. The fastest woman in the world and the first American woman to win three gold medals in one Olympics. Oh my goodness. Rudolph's journey to Olympic gold had a rough start this season. The 20th of 22 siblings, she contracted polio when she was four years old and lost the use of her left leg. Because of segregation, her mother had to drive 90 miles round trip each week for Wilma's treatment. But years of hard work and determination paid off. As a high school star, she caught the eye of Tennessee State track and field coach Ed Temple. She trained with the team at Tennessee State, a small historically black university in Nashville. And as a 16-year-old, she earned a spot on the U.S. Olympic team. At the 1956 Games in Melbourne, Australia, she won a bronze medal as a member of the 4 by This is one of my favorite uh, images that I saw in the museum. I just had to include it because it also goes across and goes along with the theme that I'm trying to uh, put forth in, in this section. And that is the opportunities in terms of sports in the early years of our country's history were very limited in respect to women. And you can see they're playing basketball. It's probably a 1950-ish photograph. Assume it's at a historically black college. 
I mean, all the young ladies are gorgeous. Um, but it reminds me of the lack of opportunities that the girls who were part of my generation had before Title IX took its effect in 1972. And one thing I made a mission of doing uh, when I was coaching youth sports and I was coaching my daughter's teams is that I ended up um, season celebrations to talk about the impact of Title IX, not only in sports, but throughout uh, all aspects of society and how important that legislation was. But to also talk about uh, a girl who was my playmate and who was every bit the athlete that I was. She was a few years older than I, but she didn't have the opportunities that I had and that today's female athletes do. My females do. And her name is Winnie Brown, and I, and I always bring her name up just to let uh, young women know that there are a lot of trail people who laid the trail for them, so that they could have these opportunities. And there are women in the past who didn't have the opportunities to necessarily um, cultivate their athletic gifts if they were so inclined. Title IX was definitely a game changer. Cheryl Miller, if you don't know that name, uh, was a uh, great basketball player in Riverside County who ended up going to USC and became a, a very good professional for knee injuries, um, shortened her career, and she had a career in broadcasting. Her brother is more well-known, Reggie Miller, but she said this about Title IX. Without Title IX, I'd be nowhere. And the pictures of Brianna Scurry, who was on the U.S. Women's National Soccer Team for many years as a goalkeeper and won the World Cup uh, championship right here in uh, Pasadena Rose Bowl, historic game, and was a uh, Olympic gold medalist. And here's what Title IX, the actual wording, of the legislation is a federal civil rights law passed as part of the education amendments of 1972. This law protects people from discrimination based on sex in education programs or activities that receive federal financial assistance. And that is the key. Because every college in the United States, whether they are private or public, receives federal financial assistance. And this impacts Sports, this impacts education, this impacts the law school, you can go down the line. It's opened the doors for women. It's some of the most important legislation we've ever had in this country. I remember when these two young girls were coming up and to see how they evolved and see what kind of women they grew up to become and to see the wisdom in their father's approach to Cooking them slow uh, is just brilliant. And Venus and Serena have definitely are game changers. And Title IX obviously gave them opportunities that uh, women before them didn't necessarily have. Although tennis has always been a pretty unique sport before pre Title IX that uh, allowed women such as Althea Gibson for example, to go and be a Wimbledon champ and make inroads into uh, that country club school. Well, we get to the basketball exhibit, and this is how I'm going to end. I've, I think I have six more slides to go. And you'll learn a little bit about me and some of my accomplishments and connections that you might not know about. And this slide says, in the early 1900s, African Americans used men's and women's basketball to help instill middle class values and promote good health as part of the broader campaign for racial uplift. Since then, basketball has become more closely identified with African American culture than any other mainstream sport. And that's classic big man duo of Bill Russell and Will Still Chamberlain. Boy, did they have wars back in the 60s. I don't just include this slide because it has Michael Jordan and the Bulls dynasty was huge and uppermost in people's mind during the 1990s. On the left is a statue of Michael Jordan and on the 
the right is an unbelievable picture of Dennis Rodman just going all out as he would do when he got between the lines. I was a part of the Bulls dynasty and was part of their six world championships. I was a front office executive and scout with them during the 90s. This is a picture of me with Jerry Krause, who was the general manager at the time. And this is uh, my championship rings. I have six of them, along with some other hardware that we got uh, to celebrate the championships. You said this t-shirt said, it's a ring thing. So I thought I'd include it on this slide. To be around this type of excellence is uh, an amazing experience, and uh, as you will see, it was not novel to me because I grew up with a man who was exceptional, and uh, who was exceptional as well. Our greatness is another way of putting it. When you're able to go through um, the National African American Museum of History and Culture and intimately know people who are on the walls of that museum. Well, one of them is your father. It's a slide I will come to last. It just gives you an unbelievable feeling and a sense of pride to know that somebody that you connected with and people that you know are thought well enough to be a part of this national treasure. And I once gave a um, presentation to a middle school. They wanted me to come talk about my dad. And I said, I can't talk about my father unless I also talk about Coach John McClendon because he was my father's mentor. And I'm going to share with you a, a video, not the one that I sent you before, but one that deals with the relationship between my dad and Coach Matt. And John McClendon's roots go back to the in terms of connection, go back to the man who founded the sport of basketball, Dr. John Naismith, who was a physical education instructor at the University of Kansas, who was also the advisor to Johnny McClendon. And uh, Coach Mack was a revolutionary basketball mind, was inducted into the uh, Naismith Memorial Basketball Hall of Fame, not initially as a coach, when he should have been, but as a contributor. And lately they rectified him on a few years ago and uh, put him in as a coach. But he was the first black coach to win national championships. Uh, won him in the NAIA, National Association of Intercollegiate Athletic Association. He won three consecutive ones in 57, 58, 59. And just an uh, incredible resource. And uh, when he would come visit um, my dad, I would get bumped out of my room and I would go sleep downstairs in my basement, which is a nice area to sleep in, and Coach Mack would sleep in my room. So that's the kind of connection I have with him, and I uh, just wanted to uh, share that with you. You see the exhibit is Beyond the Court, talking about people who have an impact not only within the game of basketball, beyond, but beyond the court. Um, so uh, all these uh, people who have been selected uh, have, have had a definite impact on society. Earl the Pearl Monroe is someone I know very well. He went to my father's college and was coached by my dad. Uh, and was a great pro basketball player and was eventually inducted into the Naismith Memorial Hall of Fame. In his senior year, he led uh, my father's team to the Division II, or at the time, College Division Championship. They were the first historically black college and university to win an NCAA title. And that year he averaged 41.5 points and my dad's team went 31 and one. He went on to win an NBA championship from the New York Knicks and just brought a flair to the game that was second <coughs> to none and uh, was called uh, Jesus, Black Magic, you name it, just because of uh, his style. He had that kind of impact on people because of the flavor that he brought to, to the court. Well, here we come to my father, who's in the African American Museum in Washington, D.C. 
which is obviously one of the reasons why, but not the only one, I, I had to go to this exhibit. His name is Clarence Big House Gaines. I'm named after my father. My name is Clarence Edward Gaines II, but most people call me J.R. Clarence. And as it says on here, Dad coached basketball at WSSU from 1946 to 1993, 47 years, compiling a record of 828 uh, wins, 447 losses. He led the Rams to eight CIE titles and a Division II NCAA championship in 1967. He's also known as the first um, black man as a coach to be inducted as a coach into the Naismith Memorial Basketball Hall of Fame. That's an honor, to be quite honest with you, that should have gone to the man I mentioned to you before, Coach McClendon. That's why I honor him by saying, if I have to talk about Big House, I have to talk about Coach Matt. So, that's my dad, I love him. And uh, he helped guide me and shepherd me and taught me what it uh, meant to do your best in everything that you endeavor to put your efforts into. So that's why I am the way I am. And I end my midterm project by highlighting a video I put up on YouTube years ago. It was for that middle school presentation, Big House and Coach Matt. Nicknamed Big House, became athletic director, concentrated on basketball to become America's greatest winning active coach when inducted into this Hall of Fame with 683 wins and 299 losses and was the NCAA Coach of the Year in 1967 when his Rams won the NCAA title with a record of 30-2 and two. and that the club was led by Earl the Pearl Monroe. John McClendon, will you please unveil Clarence Edmund Gaines. Winston-Salem State College hired a young coach, Clarence Big House Gaines. He came here in 45, straight out of college, Morgan State. I met him on a blind date, and when he first appeared in the doorway, I thought he was the biggest thing I'd ever seen. He played football at Morgan. He loved football. But he learned to love basketball more, I think. He was a head football coach for a time at Winston-Salem State. Then he was made the head basketball coach. And he was athletic director at the same time. That was a bit much because he only got one salary or two jobs. To make matters more difficult, he didn't know much about the game of basketball. But he had a friend nearby who did. John McClendon was only a few hours away at North Carolina College for Negroes. McClendon went to Big House and told him, come and work out with me and see if you can't learn something more about basketball. They talked basketball all night long. A friendship grew out of those times, and Big House would tell you this, that he learned a great deal from John and that he sort of hung on his very words. John McClendon was an unbeatable specimen of a coach. We call him the godfather of black college basketball. As a coach, you're talking about a little innovative man. Listen, <laughs> he was out of sight. He played up the temple all the way. He brought a brand of basketball that was revolutionary at the time. This motion offense that nobody else was even thinking about doing that. Wherever he played, other coaches would come in and sit at the top of the gym, and they would be feverishly taking notes. Part Delaware Indian, part African American, McClendon was born in 1915 and raised in Hiawatha, Kansas. He was a superb all-around athlete, a strong gymnast, and an excellent swimmer. But basketball was his love. He wanted to go to Springfield College, 
where basketball was invented by Dr. Naismith. But then his father discovered that Dr. Naismith was right there at the University of Kansas. So he took his son up there, told him to go see Dr. Naismith. John McClendon walked into his office and said, you're going to be my advisor. Dr. Naismith said, who told you that? And John McClendon said, my father. Dr. Naismith said, fathers are always right. And I think Naismith really saw something exceptional about this young man. He saw the passion for the game of basketball. Naismith told him that the whole nature of basketball was to have activity. And the better you could play, the faster you could play, the more entertaining it was. Dr. Naismith said it always bothered him when he would pass playgrounds and he would see kids playing in one basket. That he did not mean for the game to be played in one basket. The game should be played from baseline to baseline. When Mac Linden left school, he went to North Carolina College, became the head basketball coach, and developed most of his theories on the fast break based on the Naismith philosophy. At that time, the type of basketball being played all over the country was basically a half-court game. Played slow. Mac Linden invented a game that was vigorous, lively, at top speed. devise a system where the ball should be shot an average of shot every eight seconds. The fans break from a missed field goal. The fans break from a made field goal. I mean, emotionally and physically, there's the whole ball of wax, so they're coming at you. John McClendon invited Big House Games to go on recruiting trips with him, something unheard of today. But Mac and I hit it off, and I think that he and Brutus had this relationship of practicing together and doing this and that, so we just continued to. I didn't have a car, and uh, when you get hold up with a guy and practice a weekend and go down there, they beat the devil out of us because he had he had the personnel. Well, when you ask him, he shared it with you. This is how you achieve this, accomplish this. And as far as fast break was concerned, I don't think. Uh, Anybody ran the fast break any better than he did. In fact, I don't think anybody ran the fast break any better than we did. And uh, as we recruited around, uh, we went in his car. Most of the time, we knew we had the uh, hotels weren't open. In the spring of the year, we would uh, drive so far and go to sleep in the car. I always got the back seat because he couldn't. I couldn't get out of the steering wheel. And uh, as we'd go in to recruit, you'd be surprised at how little knowledge our people had of colleges and this, that, and so forth and so on. And if it was somebody I was looking for, we'd go in together and I did it. We were both from Winston Salem. His place, he had all the connections. Uh, We'd be from North Carolina College. It was, excuse me, uh, I think uh, it was an excellent relationship. It was a heck of a learning experience uh, for me and my basketball in life. John was, uh, I guess, about eight or nine years older. But uh, he's one of the few black guys, actually, that 
really concentrated just on basketball. And I thought we'd done a pretty good job over here one year. The same job, Blue Brown, my, my classmate. And we started the North Carolina, he started the North Carolina College Tournament. It was held in Shaw's Gymnasium. That was the newest building in, in the area. And a parquet floor in it. We got to the scene. We got to the, the finals at, at last night. And this classmate and teammate of mine, we thought we had prepared well. Final score, North Carolina's College for Negroes, 119. Winston-Salem Teachers College, 65. And we looked at each other. Said, man, let's go get some bowl. <laughs> and the guy beat you 119 to 65. And you too dumb to realize that he's got a more powerful car than, <laughs> than you have. There's something wrong with you. It did, uh, we became competitive, but as far as uh, my national and international context is concerned, uh, John was responsible. He uh, helped me develop a sense of professionalism that uh, really paid off. Of the NEIA in its program, all the black schools in America belong to one uh, one district. You had 32 districts. And that was District 29. And uh, all the kids really needed to do was compete. And Texas Southern, uh, the schools down south, then McClendon himself, after he left North Carolina Central, uh, won the NEIA championship 57, 58, and 59 three straight years. So it wasn't a matter that these little men of color couldn't play basketball. They just needed opportunity.